So as Nick said, I'm Rachel Swearingen. I teach uh, fifth grade at Manchester Park in Olathe, and I'm really excited to share with all of you the instructional cha-chas. I am not a dancer, and so don't worry if you're not either. This is not about um, that kind of dancing, but it will create um, a classroom environment where you're able to meet all of your kids' needs. So I just wanted to get started um, by introducing the book, where this comes from. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was at a summer conference here in Olathe, and one of the authors of the book, Leanne Nicholson, presented. And I actually won the book through a Twitter um, prize. And I got to talk with her a little bit more because I'd won the book, I started interacting with her. And the amazing thing about Leanne is that she's also a former Olathe teacher years ago. And since then, she's had the opportunity to live in multiple states. She has um, worked with Eric Jensen, written books with him. So brain research is something that she knows well. And I included the quote at the top of the screen here um, from the book because the premise of this book is using evidence-based research along with formative assessment and differentiation. So probably what you're thinking is you already do those things. And that's the great thing about what I'm gonna share with you today is that chances are you're already doing all four of these steps, but I hope what you'll get from today is that you'll become more purposeful and intentional with using each of these steps. Because when I did that, and I kind of slowly over the past couple of years started using more and more of the steps, and when I really spent time, that's kind of what last year gave us all the time to do, have some time. And I, I created some units where I, with fidelity, used the instructional cha-chas to plan. And this year, the growth I've seen in my students has been amazing with it. I just included one piece of data there where in a science unit that I created on the final summit of assessment, Every student in my class got an 86% or higher, and honestly, most of them got 100%. I've never had that kind of data in my classroom before, so I was really excited about that. The, the four cha-chas are down in the lower right-hand corner. Um, you chunk the learning, then you give time, kids time to chew it, you check it, and then you change it. And as you can see there, there is a little... Um, kind of chant that helps you remember. And when I shared with Leanne that I was going to be presenting some of this today, I asked her if she would send a little video of her, the, the chant to try to help you remember it, because we know from brain research that our brain remembers things better if we associate it with movement and or rhythm or music. And so she did agree to do that for us. So we are going to... Um, watch the video here of her teaching us about the cha-chas. Chunk it, we teach a bit. Chew it, they think about it. We check it to see if they know, because we might have to change. Okay. So we are going to go ahead and get started um, now that we have heard from Leanne the four steps. So hopefully seeing her give each of those movements will help you remember it as we go through. Also, if you have any questions about any of these, or like I said, chances are you're already doing a lot of these things in your classroom. So feel free to drop anything in the chat that um, you wanna share that's a way you're already doing these things. So step one, part one of this process is to set up your classroom dance floor, and that's the planning piece. So, so we want to start with the lesson plan. And in the book, they refer to this as your choreographed dance routine. So it's where you're planning out each of the steps. And I've included some actual reproducibles that you can get if you um, have a free registration at Solution Tree, which is the publishing company for the book. So I've included that over on the left-hand side there. They're fillable PDFs, like you can see. So if you prefer digital format and you can just type right in them. So lots of freebies that I'm going to be talking about. So you don't have to have the book, um, definitely to be able to use the cha-chas, but you can definitely access all of the freebies. So this is 
kind of their version of creating a lesson plan that will align to all of these parts. And the first thing we're going to do, so we're just going to kind of work through each of these parts throughout our time together. The first thing you want to do is choose a standard. And so I would invite you today, if you are a classroom teacher, teacher or you work with students to think about a standard that's coming up for you soon. Any subject area, this will work. I'm actually going to be modeling um, with some science today, but just think of a standard that you're going to be teaching. And then you'll want to break the standard down into learning targets. So those are those smaller little bits that you would be teaching each day from the standard. And each of these lesson plans really kind of covers one day of learning. So it wouldn't encompass your entire standard. So in your mind, you might even start to break, think about how you would break down the standard that you were thinking of that's maybe coming up this week in your classroom. And then it's kind of that whole backwards design um, process. You want to think about at the end of the lesson, what is it that you want the students to be able to do? And that then create your formative assessment for the end of the lesson. So what are you, what do you want them to be able to know and do at the end? Start there. And then one of the really unique pieces of their method is constantly referring to the criteria for success. So what is that checklist or exemplar or um, example that your students are going to need to know to be able to be successful on that formative assessment. These are all the pieces that they need to be able to know and do. And again, I'm going to show you an example of that. So on that lesson plan I was talking about, this is that right at the beginning, it's the planning piece. And here's my example. The subject that, that I picked with science um, our unit was called Interactions of Earth Systems. There's the standard from our standards document, but then I took that standard and I broke it down. So before they can develop a model, one of the learning targets is they would need to be able to define each of the pieces of the model. So that's where I decided to start. And when I created the formative assessment, I had to ask myself, how will they demonstrate that they can define each of those pieces, uh, each of those earth systems. And so I decided that they would show it by completing a foldable. So then that's where the criteria for success comes in. And you can see the examples on the left of different types of criteria for success you might choose. But then on the right is the specific things that I would share with the kids. For your foldable to be successful, it needs to have a definition, examples, and an illustration. And now we've done this so much in our class, pretty much every task that I give them has a criteria for success. It looks different in every subject, but that's just common language in our room now. They'll even say, what's my criteria to be successful on this? And this is one of the pieces that I think is huge because kids know exactly what you want. So you might even be thinking about something that you do with your kids. Maybe it's writing or when they solve math word problems that in the end, you're always thinking, this is not what I wanted. They didn't include all the pieces that I wanted. And for me, it took the reflection of thinking about this and saying, well, it's probably because I never told them what I wanted and what the definition of successful was. So this is a great takeaway um, from the instructional cha-chas is just making sure that every time you do something with your kids, they know what your definition of being successful on that task is. So then the next part um, before you even start the lesson, you may want to get to know your dance partner. And there are several ways that you can get to know your dance partner. One is through pre-assessing. Pre-assessing is done several days before the lesson. So not to be confused with activating prior knowledge, which you would do the day of the lesson, but whenever you're um, several days to know, and you can see the quote from their book there, what, is, what do you as the teacher, what do you need to teach? Who needs to know it? Because it might not be everyone in your class. It might be some that have gaps in their learning. And how are you going to teach it in a way that best promotes the learning? And here's just a couple of examples that you might pre-assess. It could be formally, so kind of a pre-test or a pre-quiz, or it could just be informal, a warm-up, or maybe an exit ticket question that you asked them several days before to just see where they're at. Another type of 
pre-assessing that you can do. And I love this one because you not only use it at the beginning, but you can use it again at the end is the anticipation guide. And so you just take some of your key learning from the unit or the lesson that day's lesson. And what is it that you want them to know at the end? And you are getting their brain ready before you ever even present it. And again, if you use this as pre-assessing, you're giving it several days before. And if you realize that most of your kids already know one of your learning targets, then you don't need to teach that one or maybe don't need to go as in-depth. But then it also lets you see what's the learning that they don't know. And again, there's a free version of this um, at Solution Tree. And then on the right is an example of one that I use in my class. So it's anticipating the learning because it's getting their brains connected to what you're going to be teaching. But then it also has the after learning piece so that you can go back to this at the end and see how their thinking has changed. And again, all of these ideas are anchored in the author's brain research that they've done and how the brain le learns best. And this is one example of that, giving them pre-knowledge, something to anchor what their new knowledge will go to. And that brings us to the next point, which is activating their prior knowledge. And again, that happens the same day as teaching. It gives the students a big advantage because their neural networks are ready to make connections. And that's one way that we know that learners retain what they, the information they get is when they can make connections to something they already know. So just some examples are you could have a discussion. And I like to do this in before we read fiction is ask some questions that are related to maybe the theme of the book or an event that happens in the book so that they're already thinking about it. Um, before they get there. Images, photos, videos are another great way to activate prior knowledge. So this is just an example of one that I used with the science lesson that I'm kind of using throughout today's session is the what do you notice, what do you wonder? And because I wanted them to be thinking about earth systems, that the earth is made up of land, water, the atmosphere, um, just getting them to just study this photograph and think about what do they notice? What do they wonder? And again, it's activating their prior knowledge because it's what they, something, they can anchor something they already know to that photograph, and then it will give them somewhere to put their new learning to. And then we would come back to this at the end. Another type of getting to know your dance partner, what you would want to do at the very beginning or even before your lesson starts is pre-exposure. So if you know that you're getting ready to present something that your students, and it would look different for every group of students may not already know, then you can pre-expose them to some of the contents or even a skill in advance. And here's some of the suggestions. You could go on a field trip. You could go on a virtual field trip or visit a virtual museum that might look like pre-teaching vocabulary. Vocabulary. If you have that you can show, maybe historical artifacts or something real that the students can touch or see or look at. And then again, showing pictures or viewing video clips. Another example of getting to know your dance partner is priming. And priming often happens like right before exposure to the new learning. So one of the main ways to prime your students for new learning is to make sure that the learning target for that day, what you want them to be able to know and do, you've discussed and unpacked with them so they know the purpose for the learning for that day. And they also suggest making sure that vocabulary words that you're going to use during the lesson um, are discussed during this time as well, that you just begin to use them, even if you don't define them, that you're starting to use the vocabulary words so they've been exposed to it, even before the learning of the word starts. So before we go um, on to part two, which is actually putting all of the steps together, I would like to put you um, into some breakout rooms and just spend some time sharing with your group if you had that learning target in mind um, or even just any lesson that you've taught, sharing out some ways that you get to know your dance partners, your students, before the learning even starts. So what are some ways that you've activated prior knowledge, some of your favorite ways to do that, to prime your learners before you start? So I'm just gonna go ahead 
and do the breakout rooms. Hey, how awesome is this? Fifth grade squad. <laughs> Actually, Jennifer, what grade are you? I teach fourth and fifth grade. So oh, there we go. Yeah. That's wild. You never know, it's random, but the breakout groups are fun. <laughs> I do not have this book, but I, Rachel had mentioned it to me before, and I knew Leanne Nicholson is a great presenter. Um, I'm curious if it's my end or Rachel's end. Are you guys having the video cut out just a little bit so you miss some of her words? Yeah, yeah, I think it might be her end. I think it is her end with her network. It's not bad. I mean, most of it you can understand, you can get, but every once in a while it cuts out a few words, but. Okay, one of my favorite ways to engage is usually with some kind of little video or which TikTok is making that fun because they are all over TikTok. Yeah, that's true. There's been a few times this year where I've like pulled something where I'm like, wait, I can use that in my classroom. I'll just pull it and say, look, I got this from TikTok. And they're like, oh. <laughs> Although sometimes they're freaked out to think that we're on TikTok too. What? You have a TikTok? <laughs> well, I think the key to that is previewing it first. So yeah. Yeah. I don't know to remind us. Oh man, I was I was reminding a kid not to be like spinning around on the pole outside at recess. And I was like, you're not Lil Nas X, you can't do that. And these two girls <laughs> looked at me and they went, you know that song? <laughs> <laughs> Love it when you can get them like that. <laughs> oh man, I knew they weren't gonna last very long. Okay, have you guys been to any really awesome sessions? The, the Microsoft Immersive Reader is so incredible. I had no idea all the things that could do. That's worth a look if you guys have a minute. It actually, like for ELL kids, it'll actually, so any text you can take a picture of and it will give you, it'll link a dictionary or a definition, but also like a picture. So for your ELL kids, it's like a picture of a page or a picture of a cave or whatever the word is yeah. they're reading. It's, and then it just like reads it all to them? It's I, okay. So I tweeted the table that shows all the different because it could be used on iPads on everything, all the different platforms it's accessible in or which features can be used. But I was blown away. He just the video was fast, fast and furious. He showed us all the features. It was incredible. What was it called again? Microsoft what? Oh, I don't know. She blew. Okay, welcome back. Is there anybody that would like to just um, unmute and share maybe one thing that you heard that you could share out with the group, an idea of how we could get to know our what our students know before we start teaching? Um, our group talked about the misconceptions of maybe the students saying, oh, well, I know this already or and then they, when we get into the topic, they really don't understand it or something. And then I told them about, I teach third grade. So I always take them on a train ride around our building and in the building. And then I talk about relating it to a job of an architecture when we talk about area and perimeter. That's a great idea. I love that. And movement, you're getting movement involved there, which is another way to, um, that our brain remembers information. Anybody else want to share? We we didn't really talk about this so much in our breakout, but just building up on what Natasha just shared, I like to do like schema maps with my students and just normalize, um, like Natasha was saying, like thinking you knew something and then learning that you didn't. Of normalizing that I had this misconception and now when I come back to it, this is what I've learned and this is now what I actually know. So I think normalizing that and showing them that we all do that. Adults do that. If I thought I knew this, here's my new information. And now here's where I stand and helping them to constantly be building that schema and making those connections. And I think that's really, um, you know, it gives them some validity of like, 
it's okay that I thought this and everyone's doing that. We're constantly tweaking it and changing it based on the new things that we've learned. Um, in our actual group, we talked a lot about visuals of using music, of using pictures and videos and those kind of things to build background and then build upon what they already know and activate their prior knowledge. Definitely. And I, I love how you talked about the misconceptions because it also helps you as the teacher. If you don't do some sort of activity to find out what they know and don't know, you can't address the misconceptions as you go and even have that conversation with them about um, that we all make mistakes, we all think something, and then our thinking changes um, as we learn new things. So great ideas. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into um, the next part of, of the cha-chas, which is the step-by-step -step instruction. So now this is a fun part. We're actually gonna look at those chunk, choose, checks, and change. So step one is the chunk. And then another way to think of that is that this is where you're gonna be instructing. And we wanna remember that the brain remembers best in smaller pieces. So whenever we break things down, because that's how your brain naturally wants to receive information. Um, and research shows that our chunks are best for our brain and in each of these grade bands for these amounts of minutes. So in K-5, we wanna make sure that we're not doing instruction for more than four to eight minutes. And kind of depending if you're on the lower spectrum of K-5, you're closer to the four minutes. And then as you get closer to fifth grade, you're more on the eight minutes. And then if you teach six through eight, six to 10 minutes. And so what that looks like for us is we have to take our learning and we have to break it into those little chunks. So back to the lesson plan that we were looking at, you can see that we've moved from the top part where we we plan um, the pre part, what are we going to teach? How will we know if they've learned it to the instruction part? And you can see that the first column of the lesson plan has what the teacher will do. And there's a beginning chunk. And then as you go up here, you can see the middle chunk and the ending chunk. They've even broken it down into the I do, we do, to do, you do model. But the important part here is thinking about how are you going to take what you wanted to teach that day and break it down into those four to eight minute chunks. Because at the end of each chunk, you'll do a chew and we'll be looking at that next. So first let's think about some ways that we can chunk. Here's the example from the lesson that I was sharing. So in my beginning chunk, again, I wanted about four to eight minutes. The first thing I did was assess their prior knowledge with a probe, which is included with our science curriculum. We looked at a phenomenon on, so we could begin thinking about what do we, we think we um, already know, and that was the photo of Earth that I showed you, so kind of um, giving them something to anchor their new learning to. And then I was just going to explicitly teach the Greek word parts that are connected to each of Earth's atmospheres. And I added a component of movement where we said some hand motions with each one so that they could remember what each of those parts mean, because again, um, our brain learns better when we add movement or music. And then the middle chunk is when I wanted them to do some active um, can, interacting with the text to learn about each of those words and what each of the systems include. And then the ending chunk is where they would be creating the formative assessment, which is the foldable. Some other great ways to chunk the learning include using a mind map. And we've all used uh, mind maps before, um, but in their mind map, they have broken it down to their criteria for sex, success, what it should include. And I gave an example on the right of one that some one of my students made a few years ago. Notice that it incorporates colors. And by giving them that criteria for success, they knew as they were reading how many sections off of the main idea did they need to have, how many supporting details needed to be included, and then did they need images, what do the colors represent. So giving them the specific criteria to be able to make a mind map and they could just use one of those as they are reading the text either by themselves or with a partner. And then Another thing you wanna think about is bumping this up and bumping it down, which is what they refer to and that, that differentiation piece. So you'll notice at the bottom of this mind map here, there's a bonus. 
And it says that you could show interrelated connections among the chunks. So maybe how one of those chunked colors actually connects with one of the other main ideas. And so when we do mind maps in my room, if I want, I always offer that maybe to some kids that you know need to be enriched a little bit, or I just put it up there. If you finish all of the criteria and you wanna stretch yourself a little bit more, see if you can make some interrelated connections. And then a way that I bump this down for my kids who aren't ready to do all of it is that I just require maybe one or two all of this throughout every step is how will you bump it down and how will you bump it up for the kids who need it? Chunk the text or, or the lesson is having them use a big picture note taking. So you take a text and you chunk it into smaller parts. So um, they're only looking at one part at a time and really breaking it apart with pictures, symbols, details. And then I like the last column because it asks them to think about a question or a reflection that they have um, before they go on to the next chunk. And then you'll notice at the bottom, it gives them a chance to summarize all the chunks. So that synthesizing piece, what do all of these have in common together? So then once you've chunked the learning, then you want to give them time to chew, or this is the learning piece. And so in this part, it's giving them time to really take the information that you've explicitly taught or that they've read, they've learned, and make something of it. They talk in the book about how you can have short and sweet chews. So maybe think like turn and talk. You're just going to turn and talk to your partner, and partner A is going to give this, partner B is going to give this, or those longer and deeper chews. So in the two examples that I just showed you for the um, big picture note taking and the mind mapping, you might get them started on that as part of the chunk but then the chew, the learning, is them continuing to create that on their own or with a partner or with a group, and that would be a longer, deeper chew. You also want to think about how you're going to group your students during the chew time. Do we want them in homogeneous groups, heterogeneous, cooperative learning groups? Will each person have a role? So lots of different ways that you can give them the opportunity to really make sure that they're interacting with the information that you've just given. And so on our lesson plan, we moved over to the second column. So these two kind of go together, the chunk and the chew, because you, you want to break the learning up and then you want to give them time to do something with it. And then back to what I was saying before, in every part, so the chunk and the chew, we want to make sure that we're giving them ways to bump it up and bump it down. And there's the example from the mind map that I was showing. Another one of my favorite strategies from the book is a stop, think, write. And so you'll notice their example on the left and then how I kind of took it and made it my own. Their stop, think, right as taking a text and breaking it up into parts, but I kind of adapted it and had them doing different activities, like they're watching a video and then they're stopping and they're responding. Um, there's a, some digital interactives with our science that they looked at. They read a piece of text. They did a matching activity. And so after each activity, so you can almost think of even stations, as they move to each one, they wrote what they learned, and each one kind of built on the knowledge from the one before, and then at the end, they wrote the synthesis of their learning. So just another way to break it up, and this could even become your, your chunks and your choose. Each one of those boxes could be a chunk of your lesson. You're just going to do this one little part, and then you're going to let them respond in this graphic organizer, that's their chew, letting them have time to think about what they've learned. So another way to think about that. So before we go into the third um, 
the third part, the check, I want to give you some time to just think about all this as well. And I know that there are so many more examples of ways that you can chunk and then give kids time to chew and to really learn what you've taught. So again, I'm going to put you in those breakout rooms so that you can talk um, with that group again. How, how do you take a lesson, and you might even just start thinking about a lesson you have coming up. What are going to be those four to eight minute time increments that you're going to give them just that much information and then give them time to learn it either with a group or on their own or with a partner? I have them do a lot of turn and talks during class. Um, like when I give them something to think about instead of having them think about it individually, I say, okay, turn to your elbow partners or turn to your cross table partners. Or if we're sitting on the floor, then um, they're all jumbled up and I kind of pair them up that way. So then that way they can um, feed off of somebody else and also hear what they have to say. And then sometimes I ask them just to do a little bit, a little bit of accountability. Um, I asked them to tell me what their partner said, because then that way I know that everybody's listening, but then they're also paying attention to each other and they're able to chew that little bit for understanding. So. Um, I, I kind of do something similar. I try to make them vary who they talk to too, because um, I think it's really easy sometimes for them to go to the same people. So we try to mix them up periodically. So you're always talking to someone different. Um, the other thing is, as far as the chunking of the learning is, um, I might teach a little and then pose them with a question. And then if, if since Rachel's using our science for Oleka, then maybe they have to go and read these pages that are in science in order to answer that question. And then when we come back together to read, restate the question and see what did they learn. Okay. Yeah, I think I use um, a lot of those th same things too. Um, I Like I said, I try to vary, or like you said, I like to vary it too, especially with fifth graders because sometimes they're just trying to go to their friends or they're trying to avoid one person, but they really should just try to have the more like diverse conversations with different people um, and I think sometimes I, I've noticed a lot of times, especially in like math, the, their classmates explaining it to them, their table mates explaining it to them after I have helps them a lot more than me just trying to say the same thing another time. I totally agree with you. I had the other day, I had that happen with um, a couple of resource kids. And I, one of the resource kids didn't want to come back to the back table and one of them did. And then it turned out that the one that didn't come back wanted my friend to teach her. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Do it. Yeah. And I'm listening, you know, you're kind of like, I'm like away from you, but I'm listening to you. And I'm like, wow, you totally got it. Like you totally understood that. And you just taught her that too. That was, it was amazing. Right. So. I like those opportunities too. Nick, where are you? Like, where do you teach at? Uh, I'm in the Turner School District. So I'm at Midland Trail. Um, it's like in Kansas City, Kansas, but I mean, I'm right on the edge of like county line at my school. Excellent, excellent. Thanks, Jennifer. That was good feedback too. Thank you. Okay, welcome back. 
So one of the things that I heard um, being talked about in some of the rooms was that kind of that, yeah, I do this sometimes and I probably need to do more of it. And that's one of the things that I hope that you take away from this. And one of the things that I took away from um, really studying the book and doing some more with this this summer was that if we write it down, we become much more intentional with it. And if we plan for it, we're more likely to do it. And I know this seems like a lot and I have mine all typed up and it's pretty, but really what I normally do, I just have these sheets run off and I just hand write a little note because for my own self, especially if it's something I've done before, I know what I mean when I write in shorthand or just the turn and talk or do this. So this doesn't have, this doesn't mean that you're going to spend hours and hours making lesson plans. It's just about being more intentional and making sure that you're choosing and thinking ahead of time where you're going to do this. And especially um, for the next part that we're going to be talking about the check, because if we are not checking in with our kids to make sure that they're getting these small pieces that we're learning, um, then we don't know what they need next or what we need to reteach. So some of the um, choose that I heard you talking about were some of the ones that um, I've already shared with you. And then I also heard some other great ideas, which includes um, any type of graphic organizers, but also games. And I heard some people talking about getting up and playing games, having the kids just do some quick writing. So if you just have them, instead of turning and talking, maybe just on a sticky note, or if they have reading journals, just having them write down one thing really quick. So more of a quick write, asking just a, posing a question that they either respond to with a partner on their own. That can be a way that they chew. Doing some summarizing, giving them a quick sort. Um, so going back to the example that I gave with the teaching them the different Greek parts, then you could have them give them some cards and have them sort and match them up. Um, you could even pass them out to different people and they're going to partner up. You're going to find the person that matches um, that's the definition of the word that you have. So getting them up and moving. You could just have them, especially if it's math, do three and then come see me. Another way to get them just chewing on a short chunk of information. Another thing that I use a lot now that they talk about in the book is giving the kids a thinking job. So if you're having them read text or watch a video before it starts, before they start reading, you give them a question and then specifically how they can do that. So let's say, for example, that we're um, reading the science text and we want to be able to answer how do the systems interact with each other? How do system, the earth systems interact with each other? Then their thinking job as they read might be to write down, or you can even give them little sticky arrows. We That's our new favorite thing is the little sticky arrows that you can get hundreds of on Amazon for really cheap. You're just gonna tag with your sticky arrows in this text two examples where you see two systems interacting with each other. So it's something specific for them to do related to your learning target in the text. If you're watching a video, you're just going to show a short little clip of a video that they're going to interact with. Something specific they're listening for or watching for that they're going to be ready to discuss with a partner at the end so that they have something that they're doing as they interact. You could do a discussion with talking chips and then reciprocal teaching is another. So I mean the the, the countless ways um, to have kids chew on that small chunk of learning. And again, they can be small and short or long and deep. It just depends on how important that chunk of the lesson is to them being able to do that formative assessment at the end. This is another example of a graphic organizer where it's think notes. And oftentimes I don't even use these paper, these um, printouts. I just have them even create a T-chart in their um, reading journal or their writing journal. And they're on the left is something that you're going to give them. And then on the right, something that they're going to do and lots of different ways you can do this. So that brings us to the third step, our next cha-cha, which is the check. And this is the evaluate part. Um, you can see from their mantra down here that they believe in the four E's, but for them, the four E's are examine evidence every day from every student. And then this goes back to what we were saying when you came out of your breakout rooms. There's a greater chance you'll check student work if you plan for it first. And this doesn't mean that you're going to give them a quiz or a test or have them write something every single day with every single lesson. Your checks can take on lots of different formats. And if 
in the lesson plan, here are some of their ideas. It could be an exit ticket, electronic digital tools. Um, so even for example, within our own um, resources that we have in our district, there are online activities that they can do. And so even just going in using Flipgrid, having them record something really quick related to that too. But you wanna just have something where you can very quickly check to see do they understand that that I just did in the chunk? And after they had time to chew on it, are they ready to move on to the next part of your lesson? And you'll notice that there are multiple checks for understanding throughout the lesson. It's not just done at the end because through the different ways that I can check for understanding, a turn and talk, writing it down, just giving a thumbs up, thumbs down. EPR can be another way to do it. If everybody's not ready, then maybe I either need to pull a little small group while we go on to the next chunk, or maybe we need to slow down. We're not ready to move on. And it's just a constant way to making sure that every student, um, you have data, whether it's on paper, it's visual, whether or not they're getting and achieving mastery towards your learning target for the day. So here's an example of that part of the lesson plan with my science example. So over here, what I did, their chew, after I taught them the word parts, the chew was on their own with a partner, um, on their own, and then with a partner, they're just going to try the hand motions with me and then with a partner maybe. And see, my check is just whether or not they can do it. I'm just walking around observing and then helping kids that can't because I wanna make sure that they know those parts before we go on to creating the mind map. And then in this one, they're creating their mind map on their own. And I'm using that rubric that I shared with you. Um, do they have each of those parts? Do they have color? Do they have, so they can even do a self or a peer assessment using that checklist. And then in this final chunk is where you do the formative assessment, which is what I shared at the beginning that you said that at the end of the lesson, this is what I want them to be able to do. And so that is your final check. And then after you check for understanding, then you want to do the change, our last cha-cha, and that's where you differentiate. You might you're going to use your data to differentiate more purposefully with individual or small groups of students. And there are so many different ways that we change our instruction for kids that aren't getting it. But one of the main things that they point out and that I've started to think about more is that you don't just want to do the same thing again. You need to think about how am I going to change the way I presented the information? Because if the way I presented it the first time didn't work, me just doing it again to them probably isn't going to help them get it the second time. It might be the pacing. Maybe you just need to slow it down. It might be a different student grouping. You need to change your groups um, so that you have different levels of learners together. Maybe you need to go back and pre-teach or um, reteach something before you go on to the next lesson, actually pulling a small group and just touching base with them with a different way of doing that activity. And then the last two are ways, oftentimes when we think of differentiation, we think of how we're bumping things down, but you can also think of how you can bump it up. What about for those students who really got all of this and they're ready for the next piece? You could think about giving them more student-driven inquiry or a continued learning activity. Um, sometimes for those early finishers, that's what you need as well. So on the lesson plan, it's the last piece down here. And oftentimes I try to think about how I'm going to do this before my lesson even starts so that I can make those changes in the middle of it for those kids maybe that need a little bit more or they need me to slow down a little bit. So some examples of reteaching, which is what we most common think of whenever we're going to change our instruction, is maybe breaking it down to even smaller chunks using a think aloud, going back to those, if you didn't use kinesthetic teaching, you didn't have movement already, how could you add movement to the vocabulary, to the concepts? Thinking of mnemonic devices, more tactile teaching, getting out the manipulatives in math, maybe where you didn't do it before. And they have this great template here too for thinking through what are the tools and now what are you going to do? So, that brings us to some great resources that I wanted to provide for you um, that go along with the book. Again, the book is great, um, but some other places you can go to just get information from the book. 
this summer, there were a couple of um, book study webinars from Solution Tree. I think they chunked the book. They used the same process to present the book in like four different um, webinars. And you can go back and watch those. And they go through everything that I just went through you with much more depth and uh, their knowledge of the research and um, that, that shows why these different um, breaking the learning up in this way work. And those are on Solution Tree. They're free. It's great. Um, Leanne Nicholson also has a website, MaximizeLearningInc.com. And she has so many fabulous freebies there. Um, she sends out uh, monthly newsletters with great ideas. And she is just a wealth of knowledge in brain research and how you can make learning stick in your classroom. So I would highly recommend that you check out her site. And then something really exciting is that she has, uh, her and Melissa have another book coming out because one of the things that teachers ask them after they wrote this first book, which is an award-winning book, is how can we specifically take these strategies and apply them to literacy, specifically reading, writing, and discussion. And that's their literacy triangle book that's coming out in hopefully November. And there's also some webinars that you can watch where Leanne teaches you a whole lot more about using the literacy triangle. And the fun thing about that book is that she recruited my classroom to do a lot of the sample, the work samples. And so some of my kids um, examples and samples are going to be in that book, but the tools and that she gives and the great thing about anything you watch with Leanne is that you get things to take away and use in your classroom the very next day, things to implement and use um, just very applicable. So in conclusion, I hope that from this, you got something, the one that you can take away and use next week in your classroom, because when I go to professional development, that's what I'm always hoping for. And then also, I hope that it you leave with just um, a desire to want to be more purposeful and intentional and in how you're breaking your learning up and ensuring that all of your students are learning. And with that, I know we have a little bit of time. So if you have any questions or any comments, or anything um, that you, any ideas that you have around these four different steps of making learning stick that you wanna share out with the group? Because I know we're all here to get more ideas. Looking at the chat as well, because I haven't been able to look at that. So this is my second year teaching, and so we haven't had the stay assessments previously. I purchased um, some spiral notebook reviews for math, and it's just a quick Monday, four questions, Tuesday, four questions. And so they have to get that checked by me or my aide in math. And then on Friday, they have a little quiz. And so I give them study time. And then I also, if there's any questions that they want to ask me, if they don't understand those ones that they did during the week, they can ask. Um, I have had a few students ask what manipulatives they can do. And I, I use that as like a state assessment um, a practice. So I'm like, oh, well, these are the manipulatives you can use. You can't ask questions, you know, do, do your best, those type of things so that they're pre more prepared. And um, I have gotten second grade and third grade because I do have a lot of students that are not on grade level. And I'm sure that's because of the COVID year <laughs> that we've had. So it's been interesting to see how they, how much improvement they have had since the beginning of the school year though on those. I think that's a great example of kind of that evaluation piece where you're keeping track and data and knowing where your students are at and being really intentional and then doing something with the data. Because I think that's the other thing that teachers can sometimes be guilty of is we collect a lot of data, but then we don't do anything with it. And so making sure that when you know what your students can and can't do, that then you have that plan of what, what you're going to do to help them get to the next step. Also, I think that we can link our, um, not just the recording, but I think also you can find, I'll be happy to share a PowerPoint link too, in case you want those um, links to the different websites and webinars where you can learn more. So I believe, Nick, if I'm correct, we can put that, is, will it show up in the Flipgrid? 
Um, I think we're going to put it in the grid, if I'm not mistaken. OK. So it'll be there later, probably tonight, in the grid. OK. And then I was thinking, for me, I use a lot of um, aggressive monitoring in math, is what we call it. Um, and you use kind of their pretest data to group them. And so they're in homogeneous groups. They're all with their own level. Um, and then when you're giving the instruction, it's the same, but their homework might be differentiated. And then you've got like the exemplars ready on like a clipboard. And so you're just walking around the room and kind of watching people as they go. And then you're able to have those like quick conversations. And then you've also got coding on um, a poster somewhere in your room where you can just put a quick code on their paper where maybe it's, oh, you forgot to, you missed a step here or, oh, that's really sloppy. I can't see anything. Or if they didn't show any work, um, I have like a show work code. And so now that's kind of built into their thinking. So it's not a question when we get to a test of, do I need to show my work? It's just a, already their expectation. So that's kind of an example of creating that criteria for success. I know that's not what you're calling it, yeah. but that's basically what it is. You've, you've, put, you've created a visual where they have something in front of them, this is what they have to have. And when they don't, then you've created a system as well to show them how to go back. So I love that. That's kind of the next piece of the criteria for success. When they are missing a piece, then you have a way to communicate to them to go back and look at it again. Yeah, I, I noticed a lot of like correlations between the two as I was listening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, when I start introducing checklists to them, we talk a lot about how it's not like when I go to the grocery store, right, where I just throw things in the cart and check it off the list, but a checklist is meant to be a tool where you go find evidence. So before I can mark off of the checklist that I listed two examples, I'm going to go in and make sure, what would I call an example? Are there two? So getting them to be more reflective on the checklist as well. Because you have to teach them how to use a checklist. I discovered that. Yeah. They, they, they just start checking things off, you know. <laughs> and I noticed in the chat that um, Kim talked about using Seesaw as another great way. And especially, I don't know if anybody in here is teaching remotely, but there are so many different ways that you could use all of this online as well with your online tools and Seesaw is a great one. But then also even in the classroom, they just take a quick picture of it and send it to you. That's what we were talking about in our breakout room with the little people, right? So like I was a first grade teacher last year and so much of theirs, they can't do a lot of writing. You usually can't tell what they drew. You're like, I have no idea. And they're like, well, it's actually blah, blah, blah. And you're like, cool glad you could explain that to me. Um, but if you just have them turn something in, you're never going to know what they're truly thinking about. And so that's what we were talking about. Seesaw, you know, they could take a picture of what they drew or they can draw directly on there. And then using that recording of their voice um, or taking a picture of something they created and recording their voice or reading their writing. And then you know, we're especially primary teachers are all over. We never sit down and um, but you still don't make it to everybody. Like it's impossible to make it to every kid. And so then it gives you that kind of inside look into what they're thinking and how they're explaining things and how they're using vocabulary that you can guide that your next day of like, okay, I heard a lot of us using the vocabulary word incorrectly. I need to give them examples and non-examples or something the next day to help them uh, make sure they're using it correctly. So I love Seesaw for that purpose of kind of getting to hear from every kid, especially the little people. That's a great idea. And obviously I'm a fifth grade teacher. So a lot of what I was sharing with you, there was a lot of writing involved and I've been a kindergarten teacher, but it was only for a few years, a while ago, but you made me start thinking too, about how you could adapt some of this, even with that checklist, you could just use pictures, you know, a picture for your criteria for success. And you could even use something different. That is a word that you know, labeling it something different for them, but images or just a little example. And you would also use less criteria. Maybe there's only one, two or three things that they're going to make sure that they have in their final example. Or when they create their, um, when they record on Seesaw, you're going to make sure you include this, this, and this so that they even know how to create, how to put their voice to it in a short, compact way. 
I do know young ones can tell long stories. <laughs> Any other comments, last minute comments or questions? Got it. And if you ever need anything or have questions, just let me know. I, I'm very passionate in a, this book and what it represents just because the process is effective and you'll see great results in your room and by being really purposeful and intentional. So thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. That was really good. I took a lot of pictures as I was going along too and took some notes. So I'm really excited to see what I can do with this. Great. And Nick does that. Um, I guess the recording will come to me and then do I the link to the recording? Um, I think I said I was going to, it's going to record to this computer. So I think it should be all right. And then I'll send it oh, over. So it's going to come to you. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Okay, perfect. And then um, did you say you wanted me, is that the same place where I